So this is where we get into the single nucleotide polymorphisms. And let me just start by saying the details of this 42 pages of what we call SNPs can be very overwhelming. We'll hone in with a microscope on SNPs that really matter. What determines if they really matter is what I already know about biologics. So your elevated cysteine, your elevated homocysteine, your elevated glutamate, your elevated HVA and um, HIAA. We're going to look at everything as a whole so you can kind of understand your genetic susceptibilities at baseline. It's very valuable to know the cards you hold around the game table of life because you can play a better game. So when we look at the um, the SNP report here, you can see the first column is RS numbers. And the RS number represents the highest level of detail on exactly what type of SNP we're dealing with. The next uh, column represents the SNP name. And in this case, you can see that there is an entire page, in fact two, on CYP, which is cytochrome P450. And then the subtypes, you can see how line item uh, 1 is CYP1A1 asterisk 2C, and line item 2 is CYP1A1 asterisk 4. Honestly, it's the pooled susceptibility when we're looking at something like cytochrome P450 that we're concerned about. And then the next column is, is the abnormal allele. The next column is your result. And the furthest column is whether you inherited that once, twice, or not at all. A negative negative means wild type. That's the ideal. A positive negative is heterozygous, and that means that you inherited one copy from mom or dad. Two positives, or positive positive, equals homozygous, and that means you inherited an abnormal single nucleotide polymorphism from mom and dad. So in 42 pages of SNPs, you're going to have hundreds and hundreds of SNPs, and I'm not going to discuss all of them, because some of them, quite frankly, they just don't matter to me. So what I would do is I would pay very close attention to the ones that I'm telling you are important for your particular clinical situation. And to the extent that it appeals to you, learn more about those. But I'd like to think that I'm going to teach you just about everything you need to know about the SNPs as they relate to your biologics, as they relate mm -hmm. to your clinical presentation. And hopefully that will be enough to satisfy your curiosity. There are two slots per line item, and we know there's 50 slots per page. So out of 100 gene slots, you're positive for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. 11 percent. That's minimal at best in terms of susceptibility. It really is irrelevant. So in terms of your phase 1 detoxification, you look fantastic. Why does that make sense? Well, I have a test that shows you don't accumulate organic toxins in the liver such as MTBE, gasoline additive, styrene, some other things that we checked for. So now I have a genetic test that sort of tells us about the biologics. Now phase two detoxification has some interesting points here. A couple I'll bring out. Some of them are going to be a little redundant. That is to say that some of the SNPs in the phase two detoxification pathways also exist within the methylation categories. I just assume talk about them more in the context of methylation. Suffice to say, BHMT, CBS, these all, these all have to do with detoxification, but they also have to do with methylation. Now the glutathione-specific pathways, here we call it GGA, GGT, GSR, GSS, uh, these all look decent. You have some mild susceptibility, but because you don't have any biological evidence of a lack of glutathione, um, we're not concerned about it. You have a few hemochromatosis SNPs, but because you have lab work that doesn't show any elevations of iron, we're not concerned. You definitely have some susceptibility with regard to BHMT and MAP, but again, we'll talk about that within the confines of um, methylation. NAT chemical clearance, mild. Mild susceptibility at best. So, you know, from, from my perspective, when I just look at the big picture here, your, your, both, your phase one, your phase two detoxification, your liver-related SNPs, your chemical clearance SNPs, and at least your core transsulfuration pathway SNPs are all looking pretty decent. So here's how the discussion goes from here. What I'm focusing on right now is this right here, what we call 
early methylation, early transsulfuration pathway stuff. Now, why is it so important? It's because the early methylation pathways really are sort of that pivot point for how stable SAM-dependent methylation is. And SAM-dependent methylation is so important for so many things not the least of which are the neurotransmitters that we're interested in in this case, see SAM-dependent methylation. In all reality, SAM-dependent methylation, the vast majority of it goes towards the creatine cycle. But it's not without clinical importance that SAM-dependent methylation is the driving factor for um, neurotransmitter interpathway metabolism. Okay? All right. So, what I was telling you is we know your compound heterozygous MTHFR. We also know that you have a deficit of pooled folic acid. We now know that you are more susceptible in terms of MTR than you are MTRR. And when you combine the MTR susceptibility with the significant BHMT susceptibility that we've identified, along with the MAT susceptibility, it helps us understand why homocysteine accumulates. It also helps us understand why there's a relative lower value of methionine. And we would surmise that that impacts SAM-dependent methylation. It's really the SAM-SAW ratio that determines uh, SAM-dependent methylation pathways, but that SAM-SAW ratio is, is so easily um, altered by these kind of abnormalities. So, DMG dehydrogenase in your case is also in trouble. So, now, the CBS pathway though, the SNPs that you are positive for are what we call obstructing, not upregulating. Mm -hmm. So that's why your ammonia levels are lower in your urine rather than higher. See, usually with a CBS upregulation, you're going to get higher ammonia levels. But then you also would have a low homocysteine. I would say that from a, methyl, a methylation transsulfuration pathway, you are definitely more susceptible for methylation. Sulfation doesn't look that bad. You definitely have what we call an electron donor block due to a, an altered SAMSA ratio. And the SAM-dependent reactions um, are not well supported and so there's this metabolism block leads to an energy block, neurochemical block, hormone immune block. And so here we find that the early susceptibilities within this pathway are providing a decent next level explanation if you will of why neurotransmitters and HPA access are seemingly out of sorts. Does that make sense? When it comes to these SNPs, I know your most important is MTHFR and MTRR. MTR to less extent. So I'm going to encourage methylated folic acid over methylated B12. But what do I have to do first? I have to make sure that I'm confident that you are not in an over-methylated state. Because there are that the possibility of shutting down this system is equal to undermethylation and overmethylation. And the SNPs that you have, that we've identified here in your case, are equally able to create over versus undermethylation. Herein lies my consistent observation that one cannot make a determination about where a person is in terms of over versus undermethylation based on SNP susceptibility alone. You need medical testing. But I really, I really believe that people are out there harming themselves, being in an overmethylated state, unknowingly treating themselves with methyl donors. Okay. The first line item here in your case is a standout susceptibility that is not very common. Now I see a lot of heterozygous, that's plus minus. But when I see a plus plus A NAT, which is this important metabolic step of turning serotonin into N acetyl serotonin and then onto melatonin, I automatically assume one who has this is, is highly likely to not be efficiently turning serotonin into melatonin. Now again, a susceptibility is only a susceptibility. But so then the next thing becomes is do you have symptoms of a lack of restorative sleep? Next section talks about comp T, and even though you see a number of positives there, I will tell you that in the grand scheme of things, that comp T is not that relevant to me because I've seen people with reds all the way down. So you have some heterozygous comp Ts, um, some of the important ones are affected, 
but I would say that your comp T susceptibility, which is catecholamine or methyltrespherase, um, breakdown of norepinephrine, epinephrine, and dopamine, is standard. When I benchmark you to other people, I don't see any standout susceptibility, if you will. Okay, so I would call this mild susceptibility. Remember I told you I'd be interested in looking at DBH, and that also doesn't look too bad. You have, you have a few homozygous, but for the most part a lot of green. So that doesn't provide us the explanation for the high amount of HBA that we're seeing. So the only other explanation is that you're utilizing, producing, spending, and breaking down high amounts of catecholamine i.e. dopamine, adrenaline, noradrenaline. We have an impressive display of susceptibility on page 19. Out of 12 or so GADs, you are heterozygous for all except two. So what does that tell me? That tells me your genetic susceptibilities are most impressive as it pertains to GABA. Not dopamine and serotonin. That doesn't mean that you're not depleted because remember when you spend and spend and spend you mm -hmm. do deplete. But where we're at least from a genetic perspective, behind the curve is with GABA. That's a real blessing to know because you see we can capitalize on your neurochemical strengths and pay extra attention to your neurochemical weaknesses. You, you have to build the foundation in terms of the cofactors that we see are in trouble. We have to support the methylation pathways in a proper way then we'll have unimpeded neurotransmitter rehabilitation take place over time. It's meant to be reparative. Now it isn't always reparative. Some people have brokenness, but we assume going in with every single patient that it's not brokenness, it's depletion. And that assumption proves true more often than not. Now when I'm working with kids on the autism spectrum or adults with head injuries quite significant and other things like that, then sometimes I have to say, well, we're going to do the very best we can and what we're left with, we're left with. It's this phenomenon where, you know, how far from the ledge were you at birth? In terms of your genetic susceptibility, and what are all the different, you know, sort of insulting events that knocked you closer and closer and closer and closer to where you drop off. Why is it different now? Because it's this knock, 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 knock. And then when you fall off the cliff, the rules change. The rules change in that now you're in the dumps. And constitutionally, your physiology just isn't able to handle what it used to handle. But see, yeah. the difference between being in the dumps and on the ledge there's a pretty significant distance to climb there. But once you're back on the ledge, whether you're on the tip of the ledge or whether, whether you're this far away from the ledge, it all feels the same. It's just there's this dropping off point where now something suddenly has changed and you know your physiology is not keeping up with demands. Now that said, oftentimes the trick is, you know, because of our age and stage in life or whatever, we're kind of mm -hmm. walking on the razor's edge on this side and that side. And so the idea is to stay on the razor's edge to the positive. So that we yeah. live a higher quality of life. But when you flip into the negative and you feel yourself slipping, you have to take concerted action at that point to take mm -hmm. care of yourself. Now remember, working with me at this level really ends with the lab reviews. So this is your time to truly understand what's going on. You know, the need for this level of interaction is just, it, it doesn't exist beyond the first two or three visits. Um, but the fact that we put so much time and energy into getting this sorted and so well thought out in the first few visits really is a huge time and energy saver down the road because we're so crystal clear on what needs to be accomplished. There's a lot of value I have found over the years in just really giving these first few visits what they are due fully in terms of making sure that you fully understand what's going on, I fully understand what's going on, and we understand the project as a whole. 
because you see there's a number of things to accomplish over the next, say, year, year and a half, mm -hmm. and they have to be done in a particular order. Mm -hmm. And so when we can get to the molecular biological level and assess it from that level, uh, we really are at an advantage. So the fact that we can use single nucleotide polymorphisms and cross-referencing of biologics to explain this at this level is truly a blessing.